Hey everybody, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to cover dysmenorrhea and uterine abnormalities. Let's begin by discussing dysmenorrhea. Now remember, this is a condition that's characterized by pain that starts one to two days before menstrual bleeding or with the initiation of menstrual bleeding, occurring typically in the lower abdomen, the suprapubic area, and is typically strongest in the midline. Now patients will occasionally have pain in other areas like the back or the thigh, and the pain can range in severity from mild all the way up to very severe. Typically, the pain will be crampy and intermittently intense, though some patients experience a continuous dull, achy type of pain. Now, other symptoms that might be present during this time can include nausea, diarrhea, and headache. Now, primary dysmenorrhea is caused by excessive levels of prostaglandins from the endometrium causing uterine contraction. This is a normal physiologic type of dysmenorrhea and will typically be worse in younger patients and tends to improve with age as well as following childbirth. Secondary dysmenorrhea is due to a pathological cause, and it tends to worsen as the patient ages. Once other possible causes of dysmenorrhea have been ruled out, and the patient is diagnosed with primary dysmenorrhea based on symptoms, the treatment is going to include encouraging exercise, as well as heating pad application, because both of these are non-pharmacologic methods that have been shown to improve pain scores in patients who have primary dysmenorrhea. It is, if this is not found to be sufficient, then NSAIDs and or hormonal contraception can be added, and those will typically help to improve the symptoms further. Let's move on now and discuss some congenital conditions that can affect the uterus and or the menstrual cycle. So let's start up with, start with septate uterus. Now, this is actually the most common uterine anomaly. Now, the way this anomaly is identified is going to be with ultrasound, with the image showing the presence of two endometrial cavities that are separated by a septum and no indentation in the fundus. This indentation of the fundus is a very important point in distinguishing this condition from a bicornate uterus, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, the indentation of the fundus, if present, cannot be even one centimeter large. Due to the septum in the uterus, there are numerous complications that can arise associated with pregnancy. So, For example, the septum can interfere with implantation and appropriate growth and development of the fetus. Thus, the rates of spontaneous abortion and recurring miscarriages are much higher. Depending where in the uterus the placenta has attached, there's also an increased risk of placental abruption in a septate uterus. Now, this type of lesion will also block fetal movement in the womb. This can result in possible malpositioning of the fetus, with the fetus not being able to appropriately rotate to a head-down position prior to delivery. So the prevalence of breech presentation is much higher in a patient with a septate uterus. Treatment is going to include resection of the septum to improve pregnancy outcomes, especially if they've already encountered multiple miscarriages or spontaneous abortions. This would, of course, be done when the patient was not pregnant. Then we have the bicornate uterus. I touched on this uh, for a second in the last lecture, in the last slide. The bicornate uterus is going to form as a result of a failure of the malarian ducts to completely fuse. Instead, there's only been a partial fusion. Here is where the indented fundus on ultrasound comes into play. If the uterine fundus is indented one centimeter or more, that would be consistent with a bicornate uterus. Now, there are not two separate uterine cavities like what's seen in the septate uterus, but rather there's one divergent endometrial cavity. Now, the complications here are similar, again, with an increased risk of spontaneous abortions as well as breech presentation, but fetal death, preterm pre birth, and fetal growth restrictions are also seen at higher rates with the bicornate uterus. So treatment of a bicornate uterus involves uh, uterine reunification surgery, which is a more complicated surgery as compared to the simple resection of the septum that we performed with the septate uterus. However, after reunification surgery, rates of complications associated with this typically decrease. All right, next up, we have the imperforate hymen. Now, this can first be identified at birth when there is the presence of a bulging introitus due to stimulation with maternal estradiol causing the buildup of neonate vaginal secretions behind the hymen. Now, if not noted at birth, the secretions will be reabsorbed and then the condition will not progress until menarche. At menarche, patients might present with amenorrhea, hematocolpos, which will be visualized as a uh, hymenal membrane with a bluish color, cyclic abdominal or pelvic pain, pain with defecation, and even urinary difficulties. And on pelvic exam, a bulging obstruction of the vagina would be visualized, and on ultrasound, the diagnosis would be confirmed when a thin membrane consistent with an imperfect hymen is present. Treatment for the condition is going to include surgical repair with elliptical incision in the membrane and evacuation of the obstructed contents. 
And the last congenital condition here we need to take a look at is malarian agenesis. Now we've mentioned the importance of the malarian ducts as they relate to the female reproductive tract when we talked about the incomplete fusion in the bicornate uterus. If there are genetic mutations affecting the malarian ducts, you can have absence of the vagina with absence or malformations of the uterus. Now the genes known to be responsible for these malformations include the WNT3, HNF1B, and LHX1 genes, which are typically associated with point mutations. Now, these mutations, in addition to female reproductive tract abnormalities, will often have renal and skeletal issues, uh, such as unilateral renal agenesis, pelvic or horseshoe kidneys, as well as possible skeletal anomalies. Patients will present with primary amenorrhea and are usually evaluated between the ages of 15 to 17 years of age. On exam, a vaginal dimple is typically seen, but otherwise normal external genitalia and secondary sexual characteristics are present with a malformed or absent cervix and uterus. Treatment is most often going to include the use of vaginal dilators to expand this vaginal dimple, but depending on the individual patient's preference, surgical creation of a vagina can also be performed. Moving on now to endometriosis. Now, this is defined as the presence of endometrial tissue that's located outside of the endometrium. This ectopic tissue can be found at various sites, most commonly in the ovaries, the anterior cul-de-sac, which is the area between the bladder and the uterus, the posterior cul-de-sac, which is the area between the uterus and the rectum, the posterior broad ligaments, the uterosacral ligaments, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and then finally some GI areas like the sigmoid colon and appendix. Now, there are case studies where tissue is found in many other organs of the body as well. Now, if you're presented with a case of ovarian cysts filled with a chocolate-colored syrup-like material, you want to think endometriosis of the ovary. Patients present with pain in the form of dyspareunia and or dysmenorrhea with an ovarian mass like we just discussed with the chocolate cyst as well as infertility. Now, depending on the anatomic location, other symptoms might also be present, like abnormal uterine bleeding, pain in other locations such as the lower back, as well as urinary symptoms such as dysuria, frequency, or urgency, you may also see bowel problems like diarrhea or constipation. In rare cases, for example, if the patient has endometriosis in the lungs, they may also present with things like hemoptysis or pneumothorax. So you can see that we could potentially see a wide range of presentations, but most frequently this will be dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, ovarian mass, and or infertility. Now the physical exam is typically normal, Though rarely, ectopic tissue can be visualized either on the cervix or in the vaginal mucosa. No lab abnormalities are indicative of endometriosis. You might see an elevation in CA125, but it's not ordered or used in clinical practice. It's just you know, something to keep in mind. Now, the only way we can definitively diagnose endometriosis is with a tissue biopsy from a sample that's obtained via laparoscopy. Now, treatment, therefore, is based on the symptoms. If there comes a time when symptomatic treatment isn't working, at that point, surgical treatment will be necessary. So for mild to moderate pain caused by endometriosis, the first line treatment is going to be NSAIDs and combined oral contraceptives. If this fails, then a GnRH analog such as Luprolide is used, and then either norethindrone or combined oral contraceptives are added back due to the negative side effects of hypoestrogenism. Now, if this medical treatment also fails, the next step would be to administer an aromatase inhibitor. If all of the above fail, then surgical management is warranted, where a tissue sample can be obtained to confirm the diagnosis, and resection of the lesions can be performed. That resection can be conservative with excision or ablation, or be definitive with a hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. It really depends on where the lesions are located. You also obviously always need to keep in mind future childbearing, if they want it, we can't remove everything. Next up, we have adenomyosis. This is when endometrial glands and stroma are found within the myometrium. Now, up to a third of the time, patients will be completely asymptomatic when they have adenomyosis, but those patients with symptoms can have heavy menstrual bleeding. This is known as menorrhagia and painful menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea. Now, this is a secondary, uh, secondary form of dysmenorrhea, and as we mentioned before, Cases of primary amenorrhea often affect young patients, with older patients being more so affected by secondary dysmenorrhea. Adenomyosis usually develops between the ages of 40 and 50 years in the majority of patients. So having adenomyosis at a childbearing age is going to be associated with increased risk of miscarriage as well as preterm birth. 
Now, in the vignette, they're going to tell you about pelvic exam findings. In this scenario, the uterus is usually enlarged, soft, and often referred to as boggy. Labs, such as a CBC, would only be ordered if the blood loss is severe enough that we suspect anemia. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to find any lab abnormalities in this scenario. So the first line imaging modality is going to be a transvaginal ultrasound. And what it's going to show you is asymmetric thickening of the myometrium. You'll also see a loss of border between the endometrium and myometrium. You'll see myometrial cysts, myometrial heterogeneity, and linear striations radiating into the myometrium from the endometrium. MRI is also sometimes used with similar imaging findings. Now the diagnosis can be made definitively after histologic identification following a hysterectomy. And treatment for the condition is with hormonal therapy for patients who still want to have children in the future. Otherwise, the definitive treatment is a hysterectomy. Let's finish up this lecture by discussing leomyomas or uterine fibroids. Now, the risk factors for the development of leomyomas include nulliparity, early menarche, patients who are African-American, who eat red meat, and who drink alcohol. Signs and symptoms can be broken down into menstruation symptoms, pressure-related symptoms, and infertility. So, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, and dyspareunia can all occur in a patient with uterine fibroids. If the fibroids are large enough, they can cause pain or pressure in the pelvis, and they can also put pressure on the bowels and promote constipation, or they can put pressure on the bladder, causing frequency and difficulty empty, emptying the bladder. Now, if the fibroids are pressed against the vena cava, they could potentially cause blood stasis, leading to thromboembolism. And finally, as a result of an inhospitable uterus, infertility may occur. Now, if you get this scenario in a vignette and they say, what's the best step for imaging? The first line imaging modality is going to be a pelvic ultrasound. Now, on the ultrasound, images consistent with fibroids will include well-circumscribed rounded masses that are hypoechoic. And if the, the fibroid is degenerating, rim-like calcifications within the mass may be seen with shadowing beyond the calcifications. Now, there's a wide range of treatment options for uterine fibroids. For those with symptoms of menorrhagia or for those patients who are suffering from infertility due to the fibroids but want to become pregnant, we can do a uh, hysteroscopic myomectomy to remove the submucosal fibroids. Patients not actively desiring pregnancy can be treated with combined estrogen, progestin, contraceptives, or if this medication fails, a gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist can be used, and these medications will just work to decrease the size of the fibroids. Now, for patients who do not want to bear children in the future or who have failed medical therapy, myomectomy can be used, especially if issues caused by the bulky nature of the fibroids are the main symptoms. Uterine artery embolization can also be performed, and this has been shown to drastically decrease the rates of menorrhagia, though frequently, hysterectomy will subsequently need to be done. And finally, the definitive treatment, of course, would be a hysterectomy. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit the pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is D. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. The correct answer here is C. Our final question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. The correct answer here is D. All right, guys, that is the end of this lecture. I'll see you on the next one.